Welcome to the Find My Catalyst podcast. We all have problems we're looking to solve and we know that there are solutions out there, but we struggle with this. How do we find that solution? Where does the nudge come from to help us take the next step and start solving tough problems? This podcast is designed to help you find your catalyst and take that next step. I'm Mike Simmons. I'm the founder of Catalyst Sale. This episode is brought to you by the Catalyst Sale Game Plan. It's our approach to goal setting and execution. If you head to catalystsale.com forward slash game, you can find more information. My catalyst today is Nelson Gilead. He is the founder of marketing-led growth via the buyer-centric revenue model. He's also the host of the buyer-centric revenue model podcast. Let's get to the discussion. Nelson, it is awesome to meet you. I first came across you after hearing you on, I think it's branded as the Sales Hacker Podcast. I forget what it's named these days, but it was the one that Sam Jacobs hosts. And after listening to you on the podcast, I just thought, wow, it'd be awesome to have you on. And here we are, fast forward you know, a number of weeks later, and then a number of weeks after this, this thing will go live. But Nelson, how are you doing? Yeah, great, Mike. And look at this marketing attribution happening live. And I heard about you with Chris Walker on the DGL or the Demand Gen Live podcast ages ago when it came out. So podcasting is great. It's a great proper marketing tactic. And I'm glad we can come full circle and finally get together. I absolutely love it. What, what do you like about podcasting? Well, it's a conversation that happens in a non-sales situation. So you can have conversation with your target audience, whether that's influencers, thought leaders, customers, prospects, and speak to them about things that they care about within their profession, within their industry, what's top of mind, strategy, tactics, best practices, and tips, and build a relationship with them. And so it's a great marketing tactic. You get so much juice out of it. You can take the audio, put it to the podcast. You can take the video and publish the video and chop up the video and or chop up the audio. And then you can do a LinkedIn post. And, and so you can repurpose it, get a lot of juice out of one little piece. And people nowadays are consuming audio content on demand as they're doing other things. And so that's why podcasting is so huge. But it, it's, yeah, it's a great way to build relationships with the audience and build an audience of your own at the same time. So I'm going to have a little bit of fun here because you said non-sales discussion or not. I forget exactly how you said it, but it was something about non-sales. What's wrong with the word sales? Yeah. Well, you know, if the marketing's job is to basically woo and charm and influence and educate buyers until, and so helping buyers to come aware and then learn about the product or service and lead buyers to either come to the website, try the product to some extent, or buy the product or speak to sales. And so part of marketing's job is for the buyers that need sales help, Sales is there to to help those buyers, to help them evaluate, buy, implement, adopt, be successful, manage that business relationship. And so, you know, you don't at the outset just say, hey, you want to speak to sales and then try to push them to sales. And so it's like that analogy, you're at the bar, right? There's the girl at the bar. You don't go up to her and say, hey, you want to get married? You want to get married? It's like, no, you got to put on the moves and the charm and show off your character and your reputation and your features and, you know, your benefits and features and all that type of stuff. So that they do want to have a date with you or something and then go from there. And so it's too soon for buyers to, you know, be pushed to sales. It's like they, there's a whole journey that buyers have to go through until they're ready to have a sales conversation. You can't rush that because if you do, just like the girl at the bar, they'll tune out and turn off and you'll wonder why you never heard back from her. So marketing needs to, you know, have you can say, quote unquote, communication or conversations with buyers in a non-sales situation or, you know, content, social events, networking, referral, partnerships, all sorts of stuff where it's not, you're not trying to say, hey, let's have a sales conversation right now to get you to buy, but we're going to help you with your awareness and your education. So when you are ready to speak to sales, you're, you're rip roaring to go. Those are the hot leads that sales loves. You're well-informed and it's going to be a great conversation. I have a dream, have a dream <laughs> where one day when the word sales comes up, people around the world think of it as synonymous with problem solving and helping people. That it is not about... And Anthony Iannarino touched on this when he was on the podcast a while back. He said, it's not something that you do to somebody. It's something you do for someone. It's not about what you're doing to someone or about a transaction or about a signature It is literally about helping people solve problems. Because if there's one thing that we realize, we look across the globe, there are a lot of people out there struggling with problems. And then you get the sales label put on top of it. And everybody looks at sales as I'm pitching or I'm doing Mm -hmm. something or I'm trying to convince you that you have a problem rather than actually stepping back 
and asking some questions and gathering some information and engaging with the people who do have the problem, understanding that problem, and then being able to provide a solution. So one day, this will, I believe that this will happen. And I believe that we're getting closer and closer to it. And I think we're going to start to get into it as we get deeper into the book and some of the discussion around these models of the future and where things are going. So the subtitle of your book is, well, the first book, the first title is The Death of the SDR. And the subtitle is A Buyer-Centric Revenue Model. So how we move into more of a buyer-centric revenue model, but we're going to foreshadow a little bit. So before we get there, let's talk about the challenge that exists inside the marketplace when it comes to what we've created from a, whether it's B2B or B2C selling, just selling in general, what are some of the problems that we've created in the marketplace? Well, specifically as it relates to B2B sales. Yeah. And I think this is related to what we were just talking about, about why sales has a bad reputation on, um, amongst buyers and sellers alike. And I think it's because we've set up sales for that. And in, and in a sense, it wasn't sales' fault, and we can talk about that. But basically, the gist behind the buyer-centric revenue model, which is a new B2B marketing sales model, is that from my observation, the current B2B marketing sales model is outdated and is doing more harm than good. And it's negatively affecting marketing sales, where we see high turnover, low tenure, low performance, and low job satisfaction. It feels for marketers and sellers that it, it, it's misaligned with modern buyer preferences and modern technology and know-how. And so we talk about in software marketing sales, the spiel of like out with the old and with the new, like toss away the pen and paper, adopt the software, chuck out the spreadsheet, adopt the software. There's legacy systems that have run its course. And all of a sudden you start to notice like problems. And it's at that point, it's like, whoa, whoa I need a new solution here. So that's happened to me. You know, I came up through sales development and sales and marketing and I was trying to diagnose like wh- where are all these problems coming from. And I realized that fundamentally B2B is operating on a sales-led model, growth model for the 1980s. And it hasn't adopted to today, which it really should be marketing-led where sales is still relevant and plays a role, but it's basically secondary to marketing. And the reason why that is, and we can get into that, it's that buyers want more marketing and less sales. Buyers, most of the buyer's decision to purchase is influenced more by marketing than sales. And there's lots of surveys amongst buyers and then qualitative interviews you could do amongst buyers. And then, you know, introspecting your own buying preferences to, to actually show that. It's like, yeah, I, lo- I want a lot of the information to become aware of and to learn about vendors, to try out vendors and to buy vendors upfront and on the website and from marketing, from content events, and from my peers who marketing is also influencing through word of mouth and referrals and community and review sites and everything like that, all of this access to the internet and information puts marketing at the forefront and sales still relevant, but it plays a different role than it once did back in the day where sales was really the key driver of growth and profit and where the buyer needed to speak to sales to get a lot of the information or most of the information, that's all changed. And so there's problems today. We can talk about what those symptoms of the problems, but the core problem is that the model is is outdated. So how do you distinguish between sales and marketing? Yeah. So it's marketing's job to today to generate customers. If people just self-serve and buy now or users, if there's a, a try function, you get to try the product to some extent, you know, freemium or free trial, as well as leads for sales for buyers that to some extent, depending oftentimes on the complexity of the product, or if the product needs to be rolled out across the whole organization, and if the product needs to be customized, or sometimes if it's a very high ticket item, but in any case, that tends to dictate the extent to which sales is needed by buyers. So basically it's, yeah, it's marketing's job to generate customers, users, and leads for sales. And marketing is doing that through all sorts of tactics to help buyers become aware of your company, to then learn to try and then buy and or speak to sales. And so it's doing content, it's doing social media, it's doing events, it's doing networking, it's doing referral, affiliate, partnerships, channel, website, and buyer self-service to the extent desired and possible to get all the information on the website. It's doing, you know, maybe remarketing to previous buyers and users that change jobs and are at new companies, or it's maybe remarketing to people that spoke to sales, but didn't buy, you know, and for example, a podcast is under marketing's remit. And what sales does is sales takes interested buyers, thanks to marketing, you know, leads from marketing yep. and a lead that I define a lead as a website demo request. Nowadays, it's a buyer mm-hmm. who comes to the website. They say, Hey, Thanks marketing for all the goodies. 
I am well-informed and serious about a purchasing decision. And I'd like to speak to sales to get information that I can't get from you and to help me buy, evaluate. And so the role then of sale and what marketing can do is that marketing can automatically qualify the buyer with a few questions and enable qualified buyers to book a time directly from the seller's calendar. Great. That's nice and easy. And then sales' job is to help that buyer evaluate, buy, implement, adopt, be successful, manage that business relationship, help with referrals and reviews. But typically when it comes to SaaS buying, what a buyer really wants from a seller is someone who can help them implement this product and be successful with this product. Today, sales is way more CSM than it is AE because marketing is doing a lot of that education and influencing upfront, not only directly to the buyer on the website, but also indirectly through their peers. And so if you're a marketer, you're listening to other marketers about, hey, what's good in this category of software? And you're speaking to other marketers and maybe on LinkedIn or in communities about, hey, I'm looking to buy this type of software. Anyone know what's good? What do you think? How did you use it? And so a lot of that is, you know, that's the sort of word of mouth that's happening. And so word of mouth is the key thing that you don't often see, but it's happening. And you often do hear about it through your attribution, through your qualitative attribution or interviews with buyers or asking them how they heard about you in the demo request form. So yeah, for buyers, it's like, you know, I want a seller that, can, that really knows their stuff. They've got expertise. They can really help me implement this product, show me the best ways to use it and help me be successful. They're accountable to me. And so we can talk about the sales assembly line versus what I call full sales and how that plays out. One of the things I'm doing on my podcast is I'm interviewing people and hopefully we just talked pre-show, I'll have you on about what their buying preferences are like for marketing and sales. And I walk them through that and everyone's like, yeah, I want this for marketing. I want that for sales. And I'm like, yes, exactly. So, you know, we could talk more about that, but so that's the difference between marketing and sales. Sometimes people confuse the two, but they are two different departments for a reason. And so we have to be very clear about who does what and not try to muddy the waters. I would say one last thing, and I'll turn over to you, Mike. It's marketing's job to generate leads for sales and sales job is to help those buyers. But thanks to marketing, if sales do not have a sufficient amount of quality leads, that's problematic for sales and it's marketing's fault. And so if the idea behind predictable revenue is that if you have predictable leads to marketing, predictable pipeline, that will translate to predictable revenue. So Marketing precedes sales chronologically and nowadays because of buyer preferences and technology hierarchically. So if you do marketing well, that sets up sales for success. And I use a basketball analogy. Sales is the center. Marketing is the point guard. Marketing is supposed to make a lot of good passes to the center. The center is supposed to have easy layups in the hoop so the ball doesn't get intercepted by the competition. And the center isn't taking half court shots blind that miss a lot. They're easy layups. And that's the, those are the leads that sales want. So I would say to the extent that a seller does marketing, it should be, they shouldn't have to, but it should be icing on the marketing cake. And the type of marketing that sales should be doing should be doing proper marketing. They shouldn't be pestering buyers or annoying buyers or cold pitching buyers. They should be doing the type of marketing that a lot of sellers are doing today, which is really good, which is networking and referrals from their customers and the people that they know and have built relationships with, content and social. And typically sellers have a lot of expertise because they're speaking to buyers all the time. They're in the product all the time. And and especially sellers that have been around in an industry for a while, they're a really great source of knowledge. And so many of them like to wear the marketing hat a lot and share that and speak to buyers. And sales people tend to be talking to people. I was once in sales, and you can probably tell that by my incoherent rambling, but that's what I would say for sales generating leads to the extent that they do it. So it's so it, a really good rambling because you went through a number of different components and there are a couple of pieces to pull out. One is you know, there's a, a marketing and sales should work together hand in hand on the same team. Sales will not be effective without marketing or will not be as effective as they could be without marketing. Marketing would not be as effective as they could be without sales. And then you start to get into that next line you talked about, and you kind of brought it in there with the sales piece, which is more of the success. Like what happens after we acquire customers? And then we start to create some growth pieces. And I think one of the interesting things that's happening as we get into different motions, whether people will talk about product-led growth, or you've talked about marketing-led growth, or historically people have looked at sales-led growth. And what's funny is most people who say those things out loud tend to be biased toward one view or another. And I, and Neither of those three are really focused on the people that are on the cover of your book, which is buyer-centric revenue model. So maybe buyer-led growth is going to be the new piece that's out there within the next six months. Somebody's going to coin that. And I, and I know we have fun with 
with some of these terms. One of the things I'd like to go a, a bit deeper into is this idea of expertise on the sales side and being able to help guide a customer and the button that someone clicks is see a demo. And then inevitably the salesperson who's supposed to guide because they have experience and they've worked with so many different buyers end up demoing off a sales script. Have you ever experienced that? Yes. And you know, I came from a sales background as well. And the fact is when buyers want a seller, again, they, they want someone who can help give them things that they can't get on their own from marketing on the website, let's say, or from trying the product to some extent, or from their peers who have used the product. And so typically when they come to sales, it's like, this product is very complex and I need to roll it out across the whole organization. So a lot of different stakeholders and I need to make, and it's very customizable. It's not like a plug and play, like run and gun, easy, like I get it, don't, and, or it also costs a lot of money. And so I want to make sure I'm pulling the trigger right. And so I need someone who knows a lot about this product and the use cases of this product and that can help me to evaluate it, to buy, pull in the right people, to make it happen internally and is will be accountable to me and will ensure proper implementation, adoption and success. And so the CSM role really becomes, I think, more key in sales today. Unfortunately, given the current sales model, sellers are on what's known as the sales assembly line, where you have partial sellers that can only help the buyer with an aspect of the sales process. And that leads to, unfortunately, stunted sellers who are denied full efficacy and expertise and fulfillment. And when I was in sales, the best sellers are the ones who are like, I want to be responsible for my customer and shepherd them through their success and implementation because I get more responsibility, more growth. It's all the fun stuff. And imagine the knowledge of an AE and a CSM combined. So the CSM is doing all this stuff to help with implementation success. If you can parlay that back into the initial sale and the knowledge you get post sales, it's like, wow. It's like, and also you can, because you get to see what it's required to make customers successful and what is required to do adoption successful. Again, you translate that to the pre-sale, we say, hey, yeah. And, and also the buyer will appreciate that because the buyer is often expecting a handoff. And then they have to go through the whole kit and caboodle and song and dance again. And they suspect that you're going to make promises you can't keep. When I was in sales for a startup, I was an AE CSM combined. And I saw how that made a difference with the buyer where I said, no, no handoff here. I'm going to take care of you. And my promises are going to become my delivery. I'm responsible for you. And we're going to build a great relationship. And so they trusted me. They had confidence in me. And I had more expertise and efficacy. And I enjoyed it a way, way more. And I built a portfolio of customers. And that was way more fulfilling and way more productive for the company. And those customers are way more likely to adopt, to be successful, to buy again and buy more. And in a SaaS business, a subscription business, most of the profits and growth happen after the initial purchase, which tends to be a small purchase. So for many companies, most of the profits and growth are in the land and expand motion. So it's very important that you keep your customers, that they renew and that they upgrade or that they buy more. And so again, that's why the CSM bit is so important. But now what happens is with the sales assembly line, with the AE CSM split and other subdivisions, you might have an AE or account executive that helps with the initial sale, a sales engineer or a demo specialist that helps with product expertise and yeah, and demoing the product, then you might have a customer success manager that helps with implementation and adoption. And then you might have an account manager that helps with expansion retention. So you might have like four different sellers. Now that's a lot of sales headcount and that's a really bloated sales org. And then you have the issue within sales where sales suffers 29% turnover and they suffer 11 months tenure. So, and this 11 months tenure comes from a survey of 150,000 sellers in 82 countries over like a ton of companies. Anyway, so imagine you're a buyer and you're going through all these sellers, stunted sellers, plus they change all the time. So it's like, who the heck is my point of contact? It's very rare to come across a seller who, st who stays with the company for a while. And those are gems. I once worked with a gentleman called Andy Mensch. Hey, Andy. And Andy was with the company for like 20, 30 years and buyers loved him. And even though we didn't have a great product, even though our pricing was inferior, buyers loved him. And so even though our competitors came a knocking to Andy's customers, Andy, you know, looked after his customers and they were loyal to him. And loyalty is very important, especially in a crowded market. And especially if you have an inferior product or pricing. And so, yeah, I would highly encourage people to rethink their sales organizational model. One of the questions that comes up for me is, why did we feel the need for specialization? When did we get, what was it that triggered this? Hey, let's go ahead and become over-specialized. It's a great question. In the book, I provide the history of 
the current B2B marketing and sales model and how it evolved over time. Because once you understand the history and you see all the full pieces of the picture, it's like, oh, okay, I get where we are now, where we should go. And so what happened back in the day is that in the pre-internet era, marketing really wasn't able to give buyers the information that they needed and wanted, given the level of the internet or the presence of the internet of technology, marketing just didn't have the means. And so marketing couldn't bring buyers to sales. Marketing could not generate a sufficient amount of quality leads for sales. And all that information that a buyer need was behind sales. So what happened was that sales went out to buyers and basically operated in the absence of marketing. And so first you had outside sales doing basically field knocking or door knocking. And then you had inside sales doing telemarketing or digital door knocking. And so you had the sales team doing what was known as, well, what became known as prospecting, telemarketing, door knocking, eventually that became emailing and LinkedIn messaging people to try to basically sell to people that had not been properly marketed to and had not requested their help. And so what prospecting was, was immensely laborious. It was time consuming and it had to be done constantly in large quantities to amount to anything. And sellers were unable and unwilling to do that part-time in addition to their actual sales job, in addition to helping interested buyers from marketing, or let's just say an interested buyer that they happen to come across. Because again, prospecting is, is a term used for gold. You strike gold. It's like you're looking for that one nugget of a buyer who's like, oh yeah, sure. I'll take a meeting again. Okay. Yeah, I'll buy. And it's like, oh, thank God. After all of that, all that rejection, all that avoidance. And it's so brutal on a seller. And then the question is like, so why would you want your sales team doing marketing, let alone what you could say is the most difficult, laborious, lowest yielding type of marketing. And so what happened in the late 90s, early 2000s is sales development hit the scene to take prospecting off of sales's plate and do prospecting full-time to relieve sales of doing it part-time. And so, but what happened right before the sales development came on the scene was there was one more step that happened. And so what happened was sales leaders were like, okay, sales cannot do their full sales job of the AE CSM combined plus the prospecting bit. So what they did is they said, okay, let us create the hunter farmer split. Let us create what is now known today as a quote unquote full sales cycle seller, which is an SDR and AE combined, where you have one seller do prospecting part-time plus help with the initial sale. And then once they help the buyer to buy, they hand over the buyer to the CSM who can help with adoption, implementation, success, and expansion and retention. And that happened before sales development hit the scene. So there was the original subdivision of sales of the sales assembly line was born, was the hunter farmer split, sales and account management or sales and customer success. But prospecting was still too much, even for the full sales cycle seller, even for the SDR AE combined. Prospecting was still too laborious, time consuming. It needs to be done again, constantly in large quantities. And sellers do not want to prospect. It's the worst part of the job. Sellers do not want to pester or annoy people into helping them to evaluate and buy, they want to take people who are already interested in speaking to them and then shepherding them through the process and being their efficacious selves and and sharing their expertise. And so anytime a seller would get a buyer interested, whether it was from marketing or from their prospecting activities, they would like eagerly divert all of their attention to doing their actual sales job. And then in the late nineties, early 2000s, sales development hits the scene to take prospecting off their plate. And in 2011, so fast forwarding a little bit, Aaron Ross writes the book called Predictable Revenue, which he basically says, hey, here should be your marketing sales model, which was based off of my time 10 years earlier at Salesforce and as a sales leader at Salesforce. And so what the Predictable Revenue model is based on is aspects of what Salesforce did as part of their broader marketing sales efforts. And essentially what the Predictable Revenue model is sales development plus the sales assembly line. So sales development is the marketing shtick to generate and qualify leads for sales. The sales assembly line is the AE CSM split in other subdivisions, whether that's a sales engineer or account managers. And so that codified, popularized, preserves, and fuels sales development, as well as the sales assembly line as the core B2B marketing and sales strategy today. So... I know there are a number of people who are either inside organizations where it's the first time that someone's read predictable revenue and they're looking to apply this model. Because every every once in a while, someone new comes across that book, just like any of the other books that have been out there forever. I mean, you hear people talking about Spin still today or Challenger and you know, a number of the other ones that are that are out there, including Death of the SDR. These models, a challenge comes in where you start to say, 
is this the right model for my business based on the current maturity of the business and based on the current maturity of the market and based on the type of customers we need to acquire? And, and unfortunately, I think a lot of organizations are searching for a quick fix or they're searching for some silver bullet that's going to solve for this thing because they know that, hey, it worked for Salesforce and Salesforce is this huge company. Once you start doing these kind of things, though, what are some of the symptoms that start to reveal themselves that, hey, we're, we've made some mistakes or we're, maybe there's a different way to approach this, or maybe we need to think a bit differently about how we're going to market? Yeah, sure. And so I'll address the symptoms of the problems in just a moment. But I, what, what I would say is to think of the predictable revenue model or to think of the outdated sales-led model from the 1980s, it's almost to think about it like this. People today want a playbook that they can run with, especially people who aren't like, I don't know, marketing and sales strategists who are trying to look at the current landscape and like, you know, there's a division of labor within marketing sales. There's people who create the playbooks and there's people who run them. And so I'm trying to create a new playbook, but basically just because Michael Jordan ate junk food in the late nineties does not mean that that was the cause of his success. And so if you look at correlation and causation, the predictable revenue model or sales development, the sales assembly line were aspects of Salesforce broader marketing sales efforts. And it is debatable even then to what extent it act, was it necessary and did it do more harm than good or good than harm. And the companies have elements of good marketing sales and bad marketing and sales. And you have to say, separate the good from the bad and say, hey, what really did it for them? And also was the product good? Was the demand good? Was the competition good? How about all the investment? And it's Salesforce, baby. Salesforce could have hired, I don't know, they could have done like whatever the hell they wanted and they probably still would have grown because it, no, but like, but it's just something to don't blindly copy aspects of what some company did over 20 years ago. And so what I would say is what, what, where we are today and I'll paint the picture of the problem. We got both marketing sales underperforming. We've got sales development underperforming even worse. So sales development suffers almost 40% turnover, 14 months, tenure, 11 months productivity because 14 months tenure minus three months of RAM time, and then only 48% meeting book quota attainment. So even the, so their goal is to make a certain amount of appointments set for sales a month, over half of SDRs aren't even doing that, let alone any other marketing metric that matters. And sales development is, is enormously resource intensive. And there's a whole lot of other harms of sales development that aren't realized. And we'll talk about that. But basically with that at the table, because we wouldn't be having this conversation. The reason why I say this, if marketing sales and sales development were crushing it. So, you know, if, if someone's really happy with their software, that's not a good time to say, hey, I got a different software for you. But no, B2B marketing sales is really sick. And I think that's bearing out and harming companies' growth. Because if you got a wrong playbook, your growth is going to be harmed. It's going to be less. It's going to be more costly. It's going to take longer. And so it'd be much harder. And so you might we need to require more investment or financing just to keep the party going. And I think a lot of companies are hurting now because the pain that was there the whole time is now become more painful, more visible because market conditions are facing a headwind, economic downturn. And so the best time to fix the roof was when the sun was shining and not when it's raining. And so for companies that have a better roof than others, they're not only defensive, but they're also playing offense and winning the the hearts and minds of buyers and talent who want to join a winning team, who want to be on a winning team and want a winning company. And, and so in any case, the, the symptoms of the problems that we're seeing today. Just I think, before you get into yeah. the symptoms, oh, sorry, I just want ahead. to add one more, one more thing to this, because I think it's, I think the, the discussion around Jordan and his diet and, and whatnot and is really powerful. You also said in there, that there are people who will build the playbook, they'll build the strategy, and then there are people who will operate the playbook. They'll be responsible for execution. And if you're inside an organization where the playbook has been designed by someone who does not know how to operate it and is being asked to then transfer it over to someone who will operate it, and they aren't the one who knew how to actually build it or understand the mechanics of how the engine came together, you have inserted a significant amount of risk inside your business. So don't lose sight of that. Like There are people who can design, there are people who can operate, there are operators who can design and continue to iterate on it. And the joke I like to say around this is, you know, and the Jets have not won a Super Bowl in, since I've been on this earth, 
it doesn't matter if they were applying the Kansas City Chiefs playbook or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers playbook or the New England Patriots playbook. They didn't have Tom Brady operating the offense. And if you're running somebody else's playbook without Tom Brady operating the offense, you're you're opening yourself up to a lot of risk. So really powerful kind of story and visualization, both in the challenges that people have related to applying diet and exercise into work that they're doing and chasing that silver bullet, and then also applying this inside business models. And then think about the, and you just started to touch on this night. I think you're going to get deeper into this, but what about the negative implications that have that has on the people who are responsible for working through the playbook, the players who now are coming in at 48% of plan and know mm. that their ramp time is however many months and their performance time is however many months. And ultimately they're going to be looking for something else. So let's get into oh. this. I think those and are pretty powerful. Pieces. Yes. And it's not just the players who are hurting, it's the coaches. And so one yes. area in which marketing sales are certainly aligned today, although there's a lot of talk of misalignment. And I, and I think the misalignment is because the marketing sales model is broken, but the one area in which they're certainly aligned is low and ever decreasing leadership tenure amongst marketing and sales. And so, you know, you're looking at, especially at a startup, a VP of sales lasts maybe 11 months and basically marketing and sales hovers around 16 or 17 months, depending on the statistic. And if you compare that against HR or IT or product operations, you're looking at something like around 50 months. So you've got less than 20 months for marketing sales and then more than 50 months for every other department. So if you, I think for marketing sales leaders who want more productive and fulfilling careers, then it's not just your players who are getting hurt, it's you too. And so if you're tired of constantly either leaving companies because you're frustrated or companies letting you go, then it's, maybe it's time to rethink the playbook. And so it's happened in sports where it's like, okay, we need to rethink the playbook because coaches ain't doing well and the players ain't doing well and we're not winning championships and people aren't coming to the games. And so, you know, so it's similarly here. And so the problem that we have today is because B2B is stuck on the sales led model, <laughs> like it's the 1980s voice crack, most, if not all of the information that a buyer needs to become aware of or learn about a product or try a product or buy a product is artificially gated behind sales. And so the playbook nowadays is, okay, so we're, the information is behind sales. What we're going to do to get buyers that information is we're going to have sales development go do essentially prospecting, which I consider to be a code word for spam because it's an unconsented marketing solicitation to a buyer's private inbox to speak to sales, phone, email, LinkedIn, or physical home or work address. And prospecting is telemarketing, email spam, LinkedIn spam, cold pitches, cold calling, cold email. You know, there's a lot of euphemisms, but that's how sales development is different from marketing. It's sales development who is trying to basically push buyers to sales to get that information, whereas marketing is just giving that information to buyers in the way that buyers want it, how they want it, where they want it. And so what happens with sales development is sales development will do their, and I'm very harsh about this because I think it's important to be, to be very clear, but they spam buyers, they turn some buyers off and they push premature buyers to sales. And so sales gets less good buyers, more bad buyers. And so these premature buyers, they're not well-informed and not serious about a purchasing decision because they're just looking to get information. They're tire kickers. They're people who are just browsing because they should have just gotten information from marketing and also marketing's influence on their peers. But sales development was like, come speak to sales, come speak to sales. And the buyer's like, okay, I just want to demo, maybe see some pricing. So I'll speak to sales. So what that results in, unfortunately for sales is that now you have sales is triaging all these bad leads. And that results in things like higher cost per acquisition longer cost per acquisition payback period, lower win rate, lower sales cycle, lower profit, lower revenue, lower qualified pipeline, lower market share, lower awareness, lower, lower word of mouth. It's bad news. And that is why sales is under, underperforming or largely why sales is underperforming. That's why sales development is underperforming. Buyers have gotten better at tuning out and turning off from sales development and they expect marketing, not sales development. And another thing to kind of keep in mind is that marketing is trying to liberate itself from sales development. So given the fact that marketing has all this ability that didn't have in the pre-internet era, they're like, oh my God, we could do all these things to inform buyers, make them aware, learn, try, buy, but yet they're in a straitjacket and they're forced to do things that they don't want to do and they're prevented from doing things that they should. And so right now there's a big movement within marketing, but they are primarily fighting the effects of sales development as opposed to the cause, which is sales development, which is why that my main thrust of the book 
was going after sales development, which I see as really good talent in a really bad role. And that sales development is trying to escape as fast as possible from that role. And that those who have the best interests of sales development would unlock their productivity, help them find more productive and fulfilling careers in marketing sales or operations, and sales development or SDRs will be the first to thank you. And so a lot of companies, and I talk about this and in the book, have done this. They've, they've repurposed sales development, particularly to marketing. And I outline a, a game plan for how companies can do that, a step-by-step process, a compare, test proven, and gradual transition approach that people can run with and examples of companies that have done it and the results. And so there's a way to sort of unwind. And it's a big advantage for smaller companies who can avoid sales development altogether. But it's very important to know that, as we talked about Michael Jordan's junk food, companies have you know, when they look at their marketing efforts, they have a mixture of sales development and marketing, which I would look at as bad marketing and good marketing. And they often blend the two together as opposed to separating out the components and say, hey, what's really helping Michael Jordan here? Is it his diet, his exercise and his, his ability and his hard work? Or is it the occasional cookie every now and then or, or fast food burger? And so, but smart companies are separating sales development from marketing. They're comparing the leads from sales development to marketing's website demo requests. They're looking at how much resources and budget goes into sales development versus marketing. They're interviewing their buyers and getting qualitative feedback from their buyers as to what type of marketing that they like and don't like, and what actually helps them to become aware of and to learn about vendors. And they're finding out it's marketing. And they are then gradually repurposing sales development to marketing over time. And sales and SDRs are really thrilled about that because they get to do proper marketing, help out with content, social events, the website, product marketing or market research. And so it's a really a win for everyone and for sales as well. And so, but what happens when sales gets all these premature buyers that don't really buy as much or buy as fast and sales it doesn't do too well, there's other problems or other, or sorry, other symptoms of the outdated sales led model from the 1980s that is negatively affecting sales and therefore negatively affecting marketing and neg- negatively affecting the company. And that is quota and commission. And I firmly believe in why I cover quota and commission the book. And again, I was a seller. I'm very familiar with these. And I did a lot of research and spoke to a, you know, a lot. So I break it all down. But the purpose, the true purpose of quota and commission, I believe, is it's meant to pressure the seller to pressure the buyer. And it pressures the seller with sort of desperation because what a quota is, a quota is a partial goal and metric, often the only goal and metric. And for sales, particularly with AEs, that is monthly or quarterly revenue on the initial sale. That's it. They don't look at any other relevant sales or marketing metric that ownership and the CEO would normally look at to evaluate sales as well as an individual seller. They say, nope, just revenue on the initial sale. That's all that matters. And that's going to be on a short-term basis, either monthly or quarterly. And here's where commission comes in. We're going to tie 50% of that seller's salary to that quota attainment, which is based on the buyer's decision to purchase, which is largely, as we know, outside the seller's control, according to Gartner and Forrester and Miller Hyman and Harvard Business Review and surveys of tons of B2B buyers, basically the influence that a seller has on the buyer's decision to purchase is like less than 10%. It's basically at 90% marketing and marketing's influence on buyer's peers and buyer's self-learning and self-educating from marketing. And so you're basically withholding half of their salary and that creates a bit of desperation. And so buyers feel that buyers don't want their sellers to have these quotas in commission. And so you'll have sellers that are trying to pressure sell buyers. They will be very aggressive in demos or you know, they'll try to do aggressive follow-ups. They might omit and obscure relevant facts. They might over-promise and under-deliver. It's not a good buying experience. And it's not good for the seller who you know, half of their compensation comes from the buyer's decision to purchase, which is largely outside of their control. They should be paid properly like a lot of companies are doing nowadays where they're paying their sellers the full cake and, and icing, just like every other department. They get the full salary plus bonus and not half of their salary. And then the other half pending the buyer's decision to purchase plus some amount or some amount of icing, which is their uncapped commission to the extent that they exceed quota. Most sellers miss quota most of the time. And so I think what I've seen is it's, it's basically around like 65% of sellers hit quota. But if you annualize that year over year, most sellers miss their quota. So some sellers might hit it one year, they might miss it another but that's just hitting quota, let alone exceeding quota to any meaningful extent. And so, yeah, I go into commission heavily in the arguments for commission and all the unknown harms of commission, but it's really bad news for sales. And I think there's a reason why other departments don't have commission and they don't have quota. They have proper holistic goals and metrics and they have a full salary and bonus. And so companies that have eliminated commission and have seen how much better it is for sales and attracting, motivating, retaining talent 
how much better it is for buyers and making buyers aware of that when they speak to sales on the website, letting them know that you're non-commissioned sellers. You're seeing companies like monday.com, Backblaze, Legion Logistics, Microchip Technology, Culture Amp, Plural Site, Refine Labs, Bravado, a couple more, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they've seen the light on that. And there's a whole bunch more I'm sure that I'm not aware of that will hopefully come to light but they're paying their sellers properly and the sellers are happy and the buyers are happy. And so, but fundamentally, I look at these four problems, sales development, the sales assembly line, quota and commission as symptoms of the problem, which is that B2B is stuck in an outdated sales led model from the 1980s and hasn't modernized. So the buyer centric revenue model is basically saying, Hey, we should be marketing led and not sales led. And so Basically, marketing should take center stage and marketing should do only proper non-spam marketing and therefore try to repurpose sales development to marketing gradually and minimize sales development as much as you can. So work towards that ideal of proper marketing. And then you have sales who helps buyers, you know, to the extent that buyers need their help and can focus on doing their actual sales job and that'll be great for them. And sales is an AECSM combined. So it's a single seller for a buyer. There's no handoffs. And that's the second aspect of the buyer centric revenue model. And that there's holistic goals and metrics. So, you know, if you're looking to evaluate the full efficacy of marketing and sales, you're not just looking at, let's just say, contact information of uninterested buyers or what's known as MQLs for marketing. And you're mm-hmm. not just looking at revenue on the initial sale for sales. What you're looking at to really measure the efficacy of marketing and sales and, let's say, a particular seller is you're looking at real goals and metrics over, let's just say they're annual, but you can track them monthly and quarterly, but you're looking at cost per acquisition, cost per acquisition payback period, win rate, sales cycle, average selling price. You're looking at the number of demo requests, or you're looking at opportunities, qualified pipeline, and things like that to really see like how are things shaken out. And for a seller as well, you're also looking at things that other departments look at, like what's their professionalism? What's their expertise? What's their efficacy? What's the feedback that we get from buyers? So if you look at customer success metrics, you're looking at customer satisfaction, you're looking at customer adoption and health, you're looking at you know renewals and expansion. And so you're trying to see the full picture of how a seller is shaken out. And you know because again, revenue initial sale of the buyer's decision to purchase is so far outside of their control. So you might have a good seller that actually does not generate, who isn't doing so well for a variety of reasons, but you might have a bad seller who's actually generating a lot of top line revenue from the initial sale, but is actually a really bad seller. And so maybe there's a lot of churn that happens afterwards. And so it's very misleading to measure a seller that way. And then finally, you pay your sellers properly with a full salary plus bonus instead of a commission. And that's the gist of the new marketing and sales model. It leads, leads me to believe that there's a lot to be optimistic about as people start to think a bit differently about the different models that they use when going to market. Now, it's really hard. It's really hard for a pre-revenue organization or even first million dollars of revenue organization to look at these models and say, wow, it's going to get really expensive to pay a senior sales professional to come in and have a full salary with bonus that is relatively equivalent to the OTE that they might have at plan. So are there organizations where thinking a bit differently about the model may not make sense at this stage or where they should continue to adopt some of the older models or some of the pre-existing models or another iteration of, of the model that you're proposing? Yeah. So what I would say is that this new model that I'm proposing, the buyer-centric revenue model, is actually the most advantageous to younger, newer companies who don't have these bad problems or the outdated sales-led model, which is harming companies. Like quota and commission is not benefiting the company. They are hurting the company as the sales assembly and as a sales development. And so you can avoid those bad practices altogether and have a massive competitive advantage, you know, as a a younger company to avoid those pitfalls. And so again, marketing is the key to growth and profit nowadays, is the key to predictable pipeline and revenue and profit and market share and, and better win rates and faster sales cycles and awareness and word of mouth and demand and conversion and and loyalty. And so make sure that you focus on that, like marketing precedes sales chronologically and hierarchically. So your first hire as a new company should be a marketer who knows how to get the marketing engine going and help with product marketing and help with strategy and positioning and you're defining your audience and then help to 
start going out to market and, and focusing on which plays and channels and tactics are you, or how are you going to help buyers become aware of you and learn about you and then eventually either try your product to some extent or buy your product or speak to sales or some combination of that. And so get your marketing house in order first and then sales. And so you'll have a much more leaner, like you're going to have an optimal marketing and sales team. You're going to have lower sales headcount, optimal sales headcount. And so for commission, especially there's one argument that one of the three arguments for commission is that allegedly commission helps companies avoid the risk of unproductive employees. And actually commission is more costly to them. And if you think about, first of all, how it negatively affects buyers, how it negatively affects sales. And if you think about the variable payroll and the cost and calculation of commission, the whole point of, of a salary is that it's predictable payroll and your costs are fixed. And so it's actually enormously costly to actually do commission. And you have to figure out this convoluted commission structures and clawbacks and everything. And so now you're promising your sellers an OTE or a certain amount of money if they hit their thing, just give them what you promise at the outset. And if it turns out, actually, you have to pay people what they're worth, just like in every other department. And the only way to mitigate the risk of unproductive employees is you hire the right people, you train them in the right way, just like in every other department. How are you mitigating the risk of hiring a bad HR or a marketer or an operations or product person? You hire the right people, you train them, you give them the right tools and processes, you have the right company culture and mission, a whole bunch of other things. And that's how you actually avoid that. And so don't make the mistake of saying, oh, well, I'll just short pay or think I'm going to short change the seller by withholding half of their salary pending the buyer's decision to purchase as if that's a good way. So it's a huge mistake. And so I would say for companies, so if you're a younger company today adopting a new or better growth playbook, that's a massive competitive advantage, particularly if your marketing is really, really good because you can go much further faster. Your growth will be better, more easier, faster, and for less. And if you're in a competitive market, you're challenging entrenched competitors. The fact that you have a better marketing sales experience, that you have less friction, that you've got a great brand, that's going to go a long way and helping you displace those entrenched competitors who, by the way, have an awful marketing sales model. So it'll be great for buyers. You're also going to attract talent to you because people are going to want to come to a winning team where they have the freedom to do proper marketing and proper sales. So it'll also help with your attracting and motivating and retaining talent. And so or if, if you have an inferior product or an inferior pricing, again, it's like you, if you're at the guy at the bar and you're pretty ugly and the girl is there, but if you've got a really good personality, a good reputation, good character, and you've got a good chat, then that's going to go a long way. And so companies now in software is particularly, it's, they have undifferentiated products and similar benefits and features and similar pricing. So what's the key? It's marketing. So if you, like for example, just use to concretize this, Drift displaced the incumbent inter intercom for chatbot software. You know, they came up with conversational marketing and Dave Gerhardt, the marketing leader, made Drift what it is and Drift gained massive market share as a startup against this entrenched incumbent because of proper marketing and making it easier for folks to buy them and to use them as well. And so I would say, yeah, for a younger company, it's the massive competitive advantage that I'm seeing from after launching the model, some really great traction, the early adopters. So if I look at my model as a, a software thing, it's like my early adopters so far and will continue to be younger companies that can be more nimble and more flexible and who are looking to have a competitive leg up over the competition, who might have a lot of customers ready and have already have some good elements of marketing and sales and have a lot of financing. And, and so you need to be able to do something better. And so again, a startup is building things up from scratch. Now, mature companies can make the change. It's just harder, but you know they eventually have to do it. The question is when and how much pain are they willing to tolerate? So yeah. <laughs> well, I'm excited about how the models continue to evolve. And yeah, as much as I'm a big fan of the Marie Antoinette quote, there's nothing new, but what has been forgotten there are always going to be evolutions of things and innovation that applies where you start applying other concepts into new areas. And that can create some amazing growth. If you're out there looking at go-to-market models and starting to think about how might you do something different and align directly with the people who care about the problem that you're solving for, looking at a buyer-centric revenue model approach is really powerful. Remember, it's the buyer who has the problem. It's the buyer who's spending the money. I don't know of any organization that's made their number by buying from themselves. So why not put the buyer first? Nelson, this has been an awesome conversation. Where can people find out more about you, what you're working on? Where can they connect with you directly? 
Sure. So you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm trying to put out daily content, breaking all the stuff down with videos and text. And you can read the book. The book is on Amazon and ebook, paperback and Audible. So I self-narrated it. So if you don't mind my annoying voice, I tried to put some humor into it so you can enjoy it if you're walking around the house or walking the dog. And there's the buyer-centric revenue model community. So there's a free Slack community trying to bring together revenue leaders and founders and anyone who's interested in these ideas to discuss the real problems and the real solutions to this and get access to real resources. And so we're building that out. It's in its infancy, but you can chat to people about this stuff. LinkedIn is a bit of a rubbish platform to have conversations, but it's good to get attention. So yeah. And you know, hope you join this movement. It's a positive movement to modernize and liberate B2B marketing sales for more productive and fulfilling careers. Nelson, thank you. If you know of anybody who would enjoy this conversation, get value from this conversation, please share it with them. Let Nelson and I know via LinkedIn. We'll include links in the show notes for each of the assets that Nelson had mentioned. Sales is a thinking process. Business is a thinking process. Life is a thinking process. How are you thinking differently about your process? Thank you.